Welcome to the Washington Monthly Show. I'm Ed Kilgore, uh, chief blogger for the Washington Monthly's political animal blog. Uh, I'm joined today by my friend Sarah Posner, a senior correspondent with Religion Dispatches, uh, author of the um, perpetually relevant book, God's Prophets, Faith, Fraud, and the Republican Crusade for Values, Voters, uh, and, and really a, a a sage commentator on all things at the intersection of religion, culture, and politics. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Ed. It's good to be we here. We tried to do this show yesterday with Paul Glastris. Um, as you may know, Skype had uh, some global issues uh, that prevented us getting together. Paul had a uh, scheduling conflict, but so that means that Sarah and I, you know, get to uh, get to talk about the God and politics stuff more than we usually are allowed to just as a guest, and, and there's a lot to talk about today. And we have to start with the top of the news, the rather startling withdrawal from the 2016 presidential contest of Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, uh, a guy who I think both of us, uh, from our own different perspectives, had ju uh, judged as potentially the guy mm -hmm. this year. Right. What's your assessment of... Uh, of Walker's demise, Sarah? Well, it's fascinating. I mean, I think that he, you know, I think I said on Twitter, has there ever been a candidate who so fell below his expectations? Someone mentioned Tim Pawlenty. And I thought, you know, that's not even an apt comparison because I don't think people's expectations, including my own, um, of Pawlenty in 2011 were that that people uh, that equaled that the expectations that people had for Scott Walker in 2015, um, and I think that there was a combination of things that led to the hype around Scott Walker. One was the fact that he was the Koch brothers' handpicked guy in Wisconsin to obliterate the public empo public employee unions, and so I think that there was a lot of thinking that okay, you know, he's the Koch brothers' backed guy. So surely he's going to have money and surely he's going to win. Well, that did not pan out because just because they backed him in Wisconsin didn't mean that they were going to back him in the presidential race. But the other big factor for me, and I wrote extensively about this over the past several months, was how much evangelicals liked Walker. Now, the thing about Walker that was interesting was in the world of evangelicals who don't want to listen to David Barton talk about the Christian nation and don't necessarily want to hear the candidates give some sort of phony uh, testimony about their own faith story. Walker was the guy. I mean, he wasn't the only guy. A lot of those folks also were thinking about Bush and they were thinking about Rubio. Um, at the time, <laughs> these other players hadn't really made themselves, um, made themselves players yet. Um, but, I think that one of the things about Walker was that, you know, he was the son of a Baptist preacher. He had this way of talking that really, um, that really seemed true and genuine to them. That really made them feel like he gets us, he gets our evangelical culture and he gets the things that concern us now. Um, and he can do that without overplaying the hand in the way that a Huckabee or a Santorum might. So he doesn't embarrass us with this like over the top Christian nation talk. Um, yet we can feel comfortable that he gets where we're coming from. Yeah. You wrote a very influential piece uh, a little while back, sort of drawing a parallel between um, Walker's appeal to evangelicals and the emergence of Russell Moore mm -hmm. Is sort of a uh, new voice among conservative evangelicals that are uh, not that interested in uh, vicious culture war, a lot less sort of embarrassing than the old war horses. Right. And, and it, as a matter of fact, you know, a week before, uh, Scott Walker pulls out and basically calls on the rest of the Republican Party to do something to stop Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Russell Moore had a very interesting op-ed in the New York Times. Right basically chiding evangelicals for supporting Donald Trump. So I, I guess that leads to the next big question with, uh, with Walker out uh, and with other candidates allegedly having special appeal among conservative evangelicals and maybe traditionalist Catholics. Mm -hmm. uh, where does this go now? And, and, and what can you tell, tell us about the 
at least the claims some of these other candidates are made for that constituency. So, you know, before we got on the phone, I took a look at the latest CNN poll. The CNN poll is one of the few polls that actually breaks down. It doesn't very informatively break down the respondents by religion, but it does ask the respondents, are you born again or not born again? We could talk forever about the imperfection of that way of categorizing the voters, sure. but let's set it aside for the moment just for the sake of argument. So this was the poll that CNN took after the debate last week. And Trump was still leading the pack at tw among Repo registered Republicans, 24%, Fiorina behind him at 15, Carson 14, Rubio 11. But then when you look at um, his standing among born-again registered Republicans, Trump's at 28% rather than 24%, Carson at 15, Fiorina 13, Rubio 10. So he's still, nobody has made a dent if that, you know, if we take that poll at face value, nobody's really made a dent in his born again or evangelical support. He's still there hovering around that 25 to 30% mark. But, okay, and this is a big but and fascinating to me in this poll because one of the things that the poll asked the respondents <coughs> was who would be the best of these Republican <coughs> candidates to deal with immigration. And among born again registered Republicans, 49% of them said Trump, 49%. Okay, this is after Russell Moore writes this op-ed in the New York Times, and after months ago, R Russell Moore wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal essentially saying the same thing, um, but more specifically going after Trump in the, in the more recent New York Times piece. So still, so like if, you, if this poll is right, almost half of born-again registered Republicans think that Trump is the best positioned candidate to deal with immigration. So what does that say about how reflective Russell Moore's view is of evangelicals. And I think it raises questions about that. Well, more generally, I, I think uh, you and I both read about Russell Moore. And he we should say that Russell Moore yeah. is the president of the Ethics yes. and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Con Convention. In effect, so he's the main Washington lobbyist for the Southern Baptist Convention. Exactly. Yeah. And, and he succeeded a guy named Richard Land, right. who in every respect was an old-fashioned Christian white right war horse. Right. Um, and, and Moore was picked and, and came yeah. into this position with much fanfare that he was going yes. to change the face of it. He was yeah, sort of uh, the Pope Francis of the world. Uh -huh. <laughs> I didn't say that. Okay, uh, let's go on. <laughs> I was raised as a Southern Baptist, and you can't imagine how many hackles that face <laughs> comparison. Uh, Horror of Babylon and all that. Anyway, um, no, Russell Moore, uh, you know... Um, his biggest argument uh, is sort of the scourge of conservative evangelicals is they needed to stop confusing Jesus Christ with what I call the church of the day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. Just cultural conservatism, patriotism, you know, Christian nationalism, that sort of thing. Right. I think the polling data you're talking about indicates that he's, uh, he's got his work cut out for him uh, and that the strong support for uh, comprehensive immigration reform or certainly a more welcoming attitude towards uh, immigrants that you find among many conservative evangelical leaders, uh, certainly among many Catholic leaders, isn't necessarily shared by the conservative religious rank and file and perhaps au contraire. Right. Um, and, you know, so, but beyond that, uh, this whole idea that, that uh, conservative religious folk in this country are ready to kind of turn the page uh, and adopt a more skeptical attitude towards uh, their traditional allies in politics uh, may be true, but only in a sort of an ironic way. They're ready to join this crusade against the Republican elites mm -hmm. for having deceived uh, conservative Christian voters for so many years. And I think that's the other element of Donald Trump's appeal to these folks. They really do feel burned by the fact that years and years and years after the crusade to uh, recriminalize abortion, uh, it's still legal, uh, despite all these promises from the Republican Party that they'd stand up for their values. So same-sex um, marriage yeah. is legal. Excuse me? And same-sex oh, marriage, same -sex is marriage is legal. In other words, they're losing. They're, right. they're, they're um, you know, the deal, what some have called a, uh, you know, sort of a marriage of convenience between conservative religious folks and the Republican Party has not worked out that well. So, um you know, I think, in, you know, in that respect, conservative Christian folks are certainly part of the angry base. 
I think that they are part of the angry base. Now, there's another theory about this evangelical support for Trump, which uh, Keith Miller laid out at The Federalist, which is that, you know, when a pollster asks someone, are you evangelical or are you born again? A lot of people will say yes, but they don't necessarily have the kind of real religious or theological commitment to that um, that category that many other people do. So Miller's theory is that there, and, and I think that there's some polling data that bears this out, that the more frequently an evangelical attends church services, the less likely they are yes. to be an evangelical who supports Trump. And I, so, that makes perfect sense right. to me. And so that's a very, that's a very interesting theory too, because like then the question is, okay, so who's really um, reigning in the rather heterogeneous um, evangelical base. Now, I'm saying heterogeneous in the sense that, you know, I think that many people think of the evangelical base, base as being um, very homogenous, but when you're looking at it in this granular way, it's not that homogenous, right? So you'll on one end, you'll have a Russell Moore type evangelical who doesn't want to hear uh, Donald Trump talking about deporting um, undocumented immigrants. And then on the other end, you have people who are like, yes, this is what I want to hear. <laughs> I want to hear Donald Trump talk about deporting illegal aliens, right? Which is, you know, the way that they would put it. So, Well, there's no place more granular than Iowa. So, yeah, um, right. And, you know, and, and there you have not just the people you were just talking about, but the old war horses mm -hmm. like Mike Huckabee mm -hmm. uh, and Rick Santorum, who's sort of Catholic, but got Catholic. his own mm -hmm. weird right. phalange, you know, early 20th century uh, brand of uh, conservative Christianity going for him. They're both doing the pizza ranch circuit in Iowa. You know, uh, there, there will be intense competition for the endorsement of the alleged evangelical uh, kingmakers of Iowa. Right. You and I can both name a number of them. Right. Uh, any sense uh, that you have of how that competition is going to go in that particular state? Well, you know, I covered the straw poll and the caucuses in 2011 and 2012. And what was interesting there, obviously, was, you know, you have Michelle Bachman winning the straw poll and then, you know, flaming out almost immediately. So that was, you know, meaningless. We're sort of having an unofficial straw poll kind of in, the, in mm. August and September here. Um, and so you've got to suspect that somebody is going to flame out um, of, of this part of the process. So by the time we get to February, um, maybe things will be a little bit more solidified, but still, you know, uh, Rick Santorum won the Iowa caucuses in, in 2012 and, you know, <laughs> didn't really go anywhere after that. Now I'm looking at the list of candidates who are left. And I do think that, I guess to me, the most surprising um, thing in this in this year's uh, roster is that Rand Paul isn't doing better in Iowa, um, and so I wondered, uh, you know, is is support that would have gone to Rand via his dad going to Trump? Although I don't think that there's much empirical evidence of that, um, and so you know, you're just trying to figure out how is it that Trump is currently sucking all the air out of the room. Is he stealing, you know, stealing support from Scott Walker? Or was Scott Walker his own undoing because he ran such a crappy, bloated campaign and was such a crappy candidate? Um, and so... Well, well let's, let's talk about yes. what you just raised, Rand Paul in yeah. Iowa. Uh, I believe you did some reporting on this uh, in 2012. Ron Paul had this interesting core of support in Iowa among... Christian homeschoolers. Yeah. Who, when you think about it, that makes some sense. Right. These are the people that view public schools as government schools to be, you know, uh, they, they have a hostility to the secular state that, that is interestingly uh, consistent with libertarianism. Right. Uh, even though they come from different philosophical bases. And um, so I gather this year the favorite of the homeschoolers of Iowa is Ben Carson. Uh, you know, is it possible that just this bigger, richer field with more candidates that have some sort of ostensible claim to that kind of support mm -hmm. just makes it tougher on a guy like Rand Paul to come in and inherit his father's support base? 
Yeah, so I think that's 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 probably right. Um, although, you know, because his father was building on a base that he had previously built. Yeah. And um, and I think, you know, a lot of the people that I talked to in 2012, 2011 and 2012, who were who were Ron Paul supporters, they were not automatically Rand Paul supporters. I mean, Rand was there. He campaigned for his father. Um, but when you talk to people, they're like, you know, I'm going to withhold judgment on Rand. I don't know. You know, like I love Ron Paul. He's the father of the liberty movement and, you know, all of that. Um, so. But you would think that there would be at least there would have been a, I would have expected there to be a little bit something more for Rand Paul. But then again, Carson is a well-known quantity to evangelicals. He is not, you know, I think there are a lot of people who are looking at Carson now and they think that his moment in the sun was the uh, 20, what year was it? 20. 13, uh, 2013 prayer, 23 breakfast. prayer breakfast when he went after Obama, but he was well, well known to evangelicals before that, his book that came out in the 1990s, his memoir, Gifted Hands. I mean, this was a very, um, familiar life story and person and, um, uh, you know, celebrity in a way to, to evangelicals. So I think that that is playing a role here, although I do think that there's a pragmatism to a lot of evangelical voters, that they want somebody who's electable, they want somebody who seems presidential, and the more he's seen on TV, I think, you know, not making a lot of sense on a lot of things. <laughs> there's a lot of word salad in in, in um, Ben Carson. I wonder if... Um, I wonder if some of that support will start start to fall away. But I think that he what needs to happen is there needs to be somebody who emerges as the obvious replacement. And the probably the person best positioned to do that if he doesn't screw it up is Rubio. Okay, talk a little to me about Rubio. Um we we know he's what at one point in his early life he was a Mormon. That he sort of returned to the Catholic Church. Now he's he's sort of one of these Catholic evangelicals. That's what Bobby Jindal calls himself. Uh, what what is his specific appeal to uh, the constituencies we're talking about? Well, I think that he is seen as um, a decent politician. You know, with decent, someone with decent political skills, which is part of the equation. I think a lot of people discount that that is part of the equation for a lot of evangelical voters. Um, and they see him as committed on their issues. He he did have that you know um, immigration blip, we might call it. You know the the support for the what was it the Gang of Eight, Gang of Six, Gang of Eight, um, Gang of Eight, uh, comprehensive bill. Um, but you know then again, like for that's not a blip for all evangelicals. For some evangelicals, that's going to be a selling point, right? So um, you know he's strong for them on um, the abortion issue, which is extremely important to them. Extremely yes. important. I mean, I wouldn't, even if they don't think that the president would actually have an opportunity to do anything policy wise, they still think it's like, a, a, it's a top issue. It's important. I, I, I need to interject here for our more secular viewers. Uh, something that a lot of people don't seem to realize, uh, is that conservative evangelicals have become much, much more monolithically and intensely committed uh, to the anti-abortion cause than Catholics uh, in this country, yes. at least. Yes, yes. And I would argue even more so than traditionalist Catholics, uh, who used to be the complete base of the right to life movement in this country, but for a whole lot of reasons that we don't have time to get into it's, it seems to be a much more intense issue with conservative Protestant evangelicals now than ever before and more than any other constituency. So, yes, they um, that is clearly a litmus test issue. Still, uh, and I think that yeah. that's why you saw this little Fiorina yes. surge. Let's I, talk about that. Yeah, so, I mean, Fiorina, obviously, I think she had a little surge because she had a lot of airtime in the CNN debate. Um, she held her own against Donald Trump. Um, but you cannot minimize the effect of her bald-faced lie about the Planned Parenthood videos, okay? Because even if it's not true, that doesn't matter. Okay, the fact that she so passionately 
talked about the baby on the table and its legs yeah. were kicking and et cetera, et cetera. Even though that was nowhere, there, that image is nowhere in any of the Planned Parenthood videos, but for possibly this technician who's interviewed in one of them, describing something somewhat similar, but obviously unverified. This was an encapsulation of everything the anti-choice community thinks about Planned Parenthood. It is yes. so base and evil. It would harvest the brain out of a baby whose legs are kicking on the table. Okay, so yeah. this imagery, even though it wasn't true... <laughs> No, uh, it's, a, it's a it's a myth in every it's every like it's like this election cycles bloody fetus poster yes yes yes, yes. so and to have a woman yes on the debate stage exactly uh, or you know uh, echoing their horror at this alleged practice um you know at a time when the republican party seems to be flailing around you know in washington trying to stop it i agree is very very powerful you know beyond that i mean we do have to stop and say the three candidates we've just been talking about, none of the three has ever served in public office. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in Fiorina's case, she's got a real problem with her only credential, H which is a business career, right. which some would argue she was one of the worst CEOs in the history of bad CEOs. And I, she's going to have to deal with that. But, um, you know, which is, I think, what drives people like you and me back towards uh, the idea of somebody like Marco Rubio, who is at least going to survive a vetting test for the minimal qualification for president, eventually moving into a vacuum that will be created when these, uh, you know, three candidates with no experience fade. Um, yes, but do you think, is there any evidence that Trump is going to fade? No, I don't. I'm... I'm Putting that out there is a strong temptation we all have. I mean, after all, the last presidential nominee who had not first been in elective office was Dwight D. Eisenhower, who won World War II. Right. right. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't care how much rage at the Republican establishment is going on and how much Republican voters hate Washington. This is a little weird to have three separate candidates with so little qualification and then in the case of Trump, just a sui generis candidate, you know, who's been a gigantic popular celebrity for years and years and years and years and years, who suddenly leaps over. It's almost like having a Kardashian run for president. Um, oh, Paris the Thought. What did I say? <laughs> Don't give anyone uh, any ideas. I'm going to knock on wood. Um, but anyway, that's I, all of this is a little, um, you know, unprecedented. And I think those of us who are not part of the academy are having some pleasure at the expense of our political science buddies who keep wanting to wish all this away. Right. And, oh, it'll get normal and Jebel win, Jebel win. Right, right, right. Uh, but I, you're right. Um, you really can't, whereas you can hypothesize these candidates fading, uh, including Trump, you know, it hadn't started happening yet. And I don't think we've quite plumbed the depths of why this man is so, uh, has such an appeal uh, among such a large field of um, opponents. But I, what's kind of interesting this week, Sarah, is that you've got this the, the continued craziness of the Republican presidential campaign trail and then kind of real events, even though a lot of it's kabuki theater happening back in Washington. So we talked a little about the incredible importance of this Planned Parenthood issue to Republican voters and right now, uh, I think our best expert on the federal budget stand calendar is now estimating a 75% chance that the one thing, the one thing congressional Republicans swore was not going to happen, a government shutdown is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it, it could be over the Iran nuclear deal, but it's more likely that to be That seems unlikely to me. Right. And parenthood. Right, right. So uh, how do you see this? I, and, and one of the other strange things about this is that Mitch McConnell and John Boehner, who, again, are swearing this can't happen, you know, even as they sort of enable it happening. Right. Uh, you know, are apparently relying on the National Right to Life Committee, you know, as cover for doing something short of shutting down the government. What, how do you, what's your take on all this? Well, I think that this is all about 
the sense that these uh, newer members, newer Republican members who weren't in Congress during the 2013 shutdown, so they didn't have to get any, you know, pushback from anybody from their constituents. So they, it's like they, there's no institutional memory there. Their interests, they're new, they're part of the Freedom Caucus or whatever they're calling it. And I think that they believe that they will make their mark by pushing back on McConnell and Boehner. Now, the Republican base is giving them every indication that doing that sort of disruptive, devil-may-care-about-authority thing, that that, that that is going to play, because that is Trumpism, right? So yeah. set aside what the uh, anti-abortion groups want or don't want, they clearly want a defunding of Planned Parenthood. But, you know, then the political question is, at what cost, right? So are you willing, are John, McC uh, John Boehner and uh, Mitch McConnell willing to go to the mat on that? And can they, and the answer is probably no, but then the question is, can they, can they rein in this part of their caucus, which, you know, is the, you know, we don't, give a shit about that caucus. So, um, I mean, give a shit about like what, what, what McConnell and, and Boehner yeah. want. So, um, I, you know, I, from what I hear, Colander is probably right. Like that there's a very strong chance that there's going to be a shutdown over this. To me, the question is, is that actually going to help the cause of, you know, their, the conservative cause of, of defunding Planned Parenthood. And that to me is the bigger open question because I think that there are a lot of women in this country who think that Planned Parenthood is great because that's where they get their health screenings and their contraception and, you know, so. Well, beyond that, I, you mentioned the people in Congress that weren't there during the last shutdown. We also have to remember that right after the shutdown, uh, you had the whole Obamacare rollout mess. Right. And so the Republican Party didn't exactly suffer the way many had feared they would, and that polling showed they were uh, right after the shutdown mm -hmm. of 2013. And after all, they did pretty well in 2014. So true. I think there are a lot of. That's true. There are, you know, there, and, and they as, they lot, did, yeah, right. as they did in 2013, you're also hearing Republicans try out this sort of, well, if. If Obama vetoes appropriations bills uh, without Planned Parenthood in it, uh, he's the one shutting down the government, not us. Right, right. So there are plenty of rationalizations out there, but I guess the bigger question is, um, you know, are, is at a time when rage at the Republican governing establishment is so high that these three strange candidates are the three front runners in the presidential nominating contest to people like John Boehner and Mitch McConnell uh, have the juice to impose their will on their own conferences and caucuses? And do they have sort of an interest in once again proving <laughs> that if we listen to these crazy people, it's going to be a disaster for the party? I don't, I don't know. Well, see, I, I also wonder whether Trumpism and shut down the governmentism is coming from the same well. And I wonder, I don't think it is. Like, I think that what you've How many got, wells of crazy are there? <laughs> so you've got the Trumpism well, which is kind of more like, you know, we hate Obama, we hate immigrants, we're just sick of everything, and Trump is yeah, rich. Yeah, and, yeah right, I right. hate everything, but, yeah. Right, and so there's that, and then I think there's a different well, you know, which is the well from which Fiorina might, you know, be drawing, which is we hate Planned Parenthood and Planned Parenthood is the biggest scourge on America. You know, because like some of the people who are focused, sing singularly focused on defunding Planned Parenthood or criminalizing abortion, they're not spending a lot of time on thinking about immigration. Like it's just not like, I mean, maybe individual people are, but the advocacy groups that are, you know, th these are siloed issues. So, um, 
you know, so I think that it may not may not be coming from exactly the same well of we hate everything or we hate the Republican establishment, but it's it's an ugly, perfect storm of those two different wells coming together, yeah. which is somewhat frightening in terms of, you know, maintaining some kind of rational uh, debate about these issues um, well, that, from that, immigration that to me, Planned Parenthood. That leads me to my pet theory about Scott Walker, which I'll mm-hmm. just run by you real quick. You know, when he first ran, he had this gripping saga of this, you know, unbelievable battle he had had with the unions in Wisconsin, and he defeated them, yes, and they came yes. after him. He defeated them again, and, yes. they came after, and they threatened him, and they threatened his family, blah, blah, blah. Right. That was so exciting to Republican base voters in Iowa back at the beginning of the year. But now, Republican politics has really become a whole lot more apocalyptic than that. You know, we're back to fighting the abortion unions, Holocaust. Unions, and, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I think his story <laughs> has become as small as he is, you know, in yeah, the context of a true. Republican war on the rest of us that's become much bigger and much, you know, it involves the border being destroyed by these hordes of criminals. Uh, the, again, the abortion Holocaust, the... Uh, you know, the politically correct people reading their Saul Alinsky and scheming to destroy America. I mean, these are the things that candidates are talking about. Uh, and in that context, just bashing the unions doesn't seem to be that big a deal. Is that, you know, is it possible that Scott Walker became a victim of just a much more radicalized apocalyptic Republican atmosphere than he expected or anybody. Well, I think, I think that there are two theories of Scott Walker. I think that is a perfectly plausible one, but then there's of course the nuts and bolts, you know, he ran, you know, he overspent on his campaign. He hired too much staff. He didn't have a coherent message, you know? So like there's sort of the, he he, he didn't run a very good campaign, but, I mean, that may be part of why he didn't run a very good campaign, because he failed to tap in to that apocalyptic fervor. However, did he not have the opportunity to be the reasonable candidate, the reasonable conservative that everybody thought that maybe Jeb Bush would be, right? So, like, why isn't that opening there? That opening probably well, is there, but nobody has taken that opening. Well, I'll, I'll, in that connection, I think you and I probably both think Marco Rubio is the most likely right. nominee at this point. Most likely, not certain. I noticed during the CNN debate, he was he kept talking about the left and the left wing government, and using kind of an extremist rhetoric that I haven't heard from him. Uh, so I'm I'm wondering if even he is getting a little apocalyptic here. Um, well, I think well, that the the real test of how whether he's going down that path, I think, will be um, later this week at the Values Voters Summit, right? Because oh, yeah. Rubio will be there. Trump will not. Trump declined their invitation to speak there, which I thought was huh. very, very interesting. And I thought is potentially indicative of a, a split in the base over who is the standard bearer for what the base is looking for. Is it Tony Perkins or is it Donald Trump? Well, well I, I should have to mention here that this Tony last Perkins weekend, is the president of the Family yeah. Research Council. Yeah, no, way. this okay. last weekend, yet another icon of the Christian right, Ralph Reed, his organization, the Faith and Freedom Coalition in Iowa, had a cattle call. Trump showed up. Rubio, uh, Fiorino, and Carson did not. Hmm. It's, you know... I don't know. You really have to have a program to know these people. But uh, but the Value Voters Summit has clearly always been a big yes. national yes. event. Yes. Is Trump the only one not coming? Well, Jeb Bush isn't going, but reportedly uh, that, that was because last year they didn't even invite him. <laughs> and Rand Paul probably won't be there because he doesn't do cattle calls. But, no, he, yeah. he does. He's he, coming? He, I think he is, yes. Yeah. So um, I think all the others will be there, but... To me, like I, I, I pondered this a little bit um, because I do think we are seeing kind of a breakdown more than we've seen it in the past. I think that there's been a lot of talk in the past. You know, is the religious right dead? Who yeah. is the standard bearer after Jerry Falwell and James Dobson? And da 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 da. da. And I've always sort of poo pooed that because um, you know it is a relatively monolithic block, even if they can't agree on a presidential candidate. Wow. You know, which happens every cycle. They, they argue over who the best candidate is, um, but they generally agree on a bunch of stuff. But 
I kind of feel like maybe some of the splits are becoming more acute in this election cycle. And I think that Trump may be the catalyst for that because by raising the immigration issue, he sort of pushed a Russell Moore into talking about it more. Um, and by not necessarily playing to the social issues, because Trump really isn't doing that. I mean, he sort of half-heartedly said he's against yeah. abortion and all that, but he didn't stand up for Kim Davis, which I think was really important. He said Kim Davis should yeah. do her job, right? Imagine and, that. <laughs> so I just wonder if if he's he's making some of these internal splits come to the surface and, and be a little bit more acute. I don't know what the effect of that's going to be either for this cycle in the law or in the long term. but I think it's like an interesting thing to watch because I think what you saw in the past was um, something a little less fractured. Well, and then you've got Ted Cruz, mm -hmm. uh, the one candidate who's really is preaching the old time religion, right. But who's also very much in touch with this sort of, I hate the congressional establishment right. point of view. Right. He's in the Senate purely to attack it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and whose father is kind of a parody of the old school, who warms up the crowds at his every rally, yeah. is a parody of the old school Christian right, thunder from God kind of preacher. Right. And I suspect he will be there at the Value Voters Summit with bells on, ready to make a big splash. And he is still a viable candidate, you know, even though... You don't, don't think so? No, I don't. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. I don't because I think he's made too many enemies. I think that too many people don't like him. Yeah, um, well. So in terms of like either his um, Senate colleagues, um, yeah. other, I, I think that it, his, his culture warriorism is unappealing to a certain segment of the evangelical sure. base. And um, so... Yeah. And, you know, I think there's too many of them. There's too many of the Cruz, Santorum, Huckabee, Jindal, yeah, you know, yeah. battling it out kind of at the bottom there. Yeah, though, I, I, in terms of your first point, I think right now there are a lot of folks in the Republican establishment who would, you know, crawl all the way to Houston to beg Ted Cruz to be the nominee before they'd accept Donald Trump. Yeah, that's so probably it's all, true. It's, it's all relative. <laughs> so, okay, the other big thing happening in Washington this week, of course, that has to, something to do with our common interest in religion and politics is the Pope's coming to town. Yes. Uh, you know, Causing traffic be, jams. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be, well, out here in California, we don't have much to worry about. Right. Uh, you know, he's going to be at a White House uh, reception tonight, private meeting with the president. You know, he's going to participate in the um, canonization of a fairly controversial um, uh, Franciscan missionary from California uh, tomorrow in D.C. And then Thursday he speaks to Congress. No, it's, uh, all, it's the other way. It, it's tomorrow he speaks to Congress. But oh, yeah, is it? Okay. Yeah. I was looking at an old schedule. Yeah. Okay, fine. I think, uh, but yes. Something, but that, something that I can't observe because of Yom Kippur. So anyway, yes. but yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll be observing it, though, from a safe distance. Um, I, you know, I think you and I have sort of a, a common skepticism towards a lot of what's being said about this Pope and this visit, uh, partially because I think we understand that Francis does, in all of his views, reflect Catholic tradition, mm -hmm. uh, even sort of the anti-capitalist uh, talk that he certainly has been doing yep. is, uh, you know, is, is certainly part of a pre-modern hostility to capitalism that's always been present, present in Catholic doctrine, or the reason Catholics were mm, a little soft on fascism uh, early in the last century, because uh, it was not capitalist, um, you know, and, and certainly on, in terms of striking a different tone with respect to abortion, the role of women in the church, uh, homosexuality. Uh, so far, he hasn't changed any doctrines. Uh, so I, I think you and I both think this whole Francis revolution is a little overcooked, uh, and that once he visits and once he makes his speech to Congress tomorrow, then we're going to be in a gigantic spin room Yes, uh, where conservatives exaggerate everything he has to say about abortion, uh, or respect for life and all that stuff, and, and liberals try to uh, effectively excommunicate conservative Catholics uh, for not getting with the program on climate change. You, 
what's what are, beyond that? What are your thoughts? Well, I think that every time Pope Francis says something, there is the, the Washington Post religion reporter Michelle Borstein tweeted something hilarious and perfect a few weeks ago with something like. Pope Francis said something, everybody has a different theory on what it means. <laughs> and um, so, you know, he will come and he will say things and everyone will have their own interpretation um, that serves their political interests yeah. um, about what it means. And I think that that will be most um, most visible in, in the context of his congressional speech, right? Because everybody is going to be looking for, is he going to take a poke at the Republicans for trickle down economics or, um, or for, um, uh, not addressing climate change? Like what, how is he going to phrase this? And I think that for Francis, he is going to talk in purely spiritual terms, but want to have a political effect. But, um, how that political effect is interpreted is going to widely vary, I think. Now, I don't agree that just because the Pope says it, that it should be translated into policy, because we have separation of church and state here in the United States. Sort of. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, even though I agree with him on climate change, right, I think that the best way to interpret if he makes comments on climate change is to, you know, he's calling on people to examine their spiritual selves and what to do about climate change. He's not endorsing a particular political program or policy or what have you. Um, and to that extent, I guess, you know, I mean, if people want to do that, that's fine. And if they don't, that is also fine. A congressional speech should not compel people to examine their, their spiritual selves. Um, but I think that, this will be so over over covered. I think there's something like eight thousand journalists credentialed to cover the Pope's trip. Eight How many? thousand. Oop. So um, you know, and obviously not all of these are reporters are US reporters. It's reporters from all all over the world covering this. But I think that, you know, I think we shouldn't overthink this. Okay. He's the Pope and a lot of Catholics disagree with him from both sides, right? So yeah. Catholics on the left disagree with him on things. Catholics on the right disagree with him on things. He is not the be all and end all. He is a person. He is not God. And even if he were, you know, <laughs> back to the separation of church and state. So I just kind of feel like this is going to get overplayed. And then three months from now, we will have entirely forgotten everything that happened. So if he did inspire people to act on climate change, we probably won't see a lot of evidence of let that. Me, let me just ask you about one element of his trip that hasn't been discussed quite as much. Uh, and it's a little less susceptible to, to the spin wars that I think we're both anticipating. Um, Francis is a native Spanish speaker. Mm -hmm. He's coming to, among other things, visit an American Catholic church that's rapidly becoming a Latino dominated church, um, you know, in a, in a political context where the front runner for the Republican presidential nomination has attacked another candidate for speaking Spanish in America. Right. <laughs> uh, Francis is going to be speaking a lot of Spanish mm -hmm. and he's going to be talking to a lot of Spanish speaking Americans. Uh, is it possible his trip will kind of mobilize Hispanic Catholics to speak up for themselves a little bit. I don't know. I'm just, I'm wondering about that dynamic. Uh, you know, well, I guess the question is, will that get covered? Right. See, that's yeah. the thing. It's like, I think that, um, it's up to the press to cover the marginalized groups reaction to the Pope's visit. Right. But I think that the press, what's going to get lost that will that will likely get lost in press coverage compared to what did the Pope's uh, speech mean to Catholic members of Congress, um, and I think that that the press is probably going to focus on that a little bit more than than the other thing, or, or focus on Trump more than the other thing. I, I just I don't have a lot of confidence that if he um, if he has that effect on American Catholics that it will get that much coverage. But, you know, the other interesting thing, I mean, I think that there is a, um, that there is a sense that, that the American Catholic Church is increasingly, 
increasingly Latino. But Rachel Zoll, who's the Associated Press's religion reporter, she had a piece last week about how, you know, they're having trouble holding on to Latino, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, so Latino uh, Catholics. So I think it's very, very complicated. And I think that his, the purpose of his trip is very, very complicated because I think it, while it's being perceived as a broader political message, it really mostly has to do with the church itself. Well, and I think you and I would agree from long experience with the subject that if there's anything the uh, mainstream media are not very good at, it's covering anything vaguely to do with religion. <laughs> Uh, so I think we can expect a lot of really bad coverage, but we'll be around to try to correct perceptions as we can. Uh, we probably need to wrap it up on that note. Um, I hope you have an easy fast. Thank you. Uh, and, and I, uh, you know, it's really been fun to have you here and I hope you could come back. Uh, Sarah Posner and Ed Kilgore signing off for this week. Thanks.